good. Welcome to Dirt Sweat and Gears and the driveway of dysentery. So last time we were with this truck, we spent some time investigating why this truck potentially caught fire in the first place. Now we did discover this fuel line that was uh, cut and spliced with rubber line, and that may have been the fuel for the fire, but the initial spark that caused it to go off was potentially a ground strap that was contacting with what was potentially exposed wire. Now we don't know because that's all on fire and that was all burnt up anyway. So I went ahead and cut that wire and we tried to start this truck and it didn't go very well. So clearly there is more work to do. We're just gonna start to get more deeper into the diagnostic process as a whole before we go trying to start this up and run it again. So that's gonna give us a lot of insights into what work is ahead of us on this project. Uh, things like, is this motor even good to begin with? Uh, will I need to replace head gaskets? Those are questions that we're seeking to answer uh, as we try to get this all back together. Another huge concern of mine is these vacuum lines. I have no idea where these vacuum lines are supposed to go. There's like two miles of vacuum lines under this hood. It is very confusing and I'm just gonna have to do a lot of trial and error and a lot of research along the way to try to get all of the connections right. Most people, when they show you how to do these vacuum lines, they're just bypassing systems and making it work. But making it work isn't making it legal in California. So that's really a challenge that I have. I have to get this smog legal. I have to be able to take this down to the shop and blow clean numbers. So that means getting the vacuum lines sorted out the way they're supposed to be. And then I know that the catalytic converter is also bad. That's a problem for a later project. But right now, there's a lot to do and there's a lot of things I don't know how to do. And here's where I'm having lots of trouble is these vacuum lines. So we have the vacuum line that goes uh, from the distributor and I'm not exactly sure where that goes. It just ends up right here. And then there's this T-junction here. I think it could possibly go into this T-junction that goes into this thingy over here, but then it goes back down into the uh, looks to be the choke. So I, I'm really just kind of lost here. Uh, and I'm just trying to replace these one at a time. And then these lines are just really, really loose. So I don't expect them to get a very good seal. So I'm gonna have to replace those hoses as well. I'm pro probably just gonna have to go to AutoZone and get like, you know, a quarter mile worth of vacuum tube and then just cut it as I go because this is really confusing. Um, and then we've got this mess here. This goes to nothing. I'm not sure what this is, uh, but it comes out of the carburetor. This could be some kind of regulator or something. I'm not sure, but I don't know where this goes to. So this is all very confusing. And then here's the diagram. The diagram isn't, I don't know, I just, I'm having a hard time visualizing this diagram. I'm having a hard time correlating what's on this diagram to the parts I'm seeing in front of me. All right, well, uh, I ran into a little bit of a road bump. It turns out that I don't have enough spark plugs for this truck. Um, I thought I bought six, but apparently I only bought four. So I need to buy two more. But in the meantime, I have been doing whatever I can. So, so first let's go take a look at the spark plugs themselves and then we're gonna take a look at the compression numbers. So this is the left and this is the right. These are the four I was able to pull. From back to front, this one is in the back. You can see, um, well, I've seen worse but I've also seen better. That is, that could be coolant on the spark plug because it's all orange. But for the most part, aside from that, this is pretty clean, which might not be a good thing. 
let's go take a look at the compression numbers. So I have been using my compression tool to test the compression as I am replacing these spark plugs. And here's what I found so far. In the back, 75. In the middle, 100. In the front, 75. And then in the back on this side, I got zero. Zero is not a good number to have. So I'm really curious about the compression of these other two cylinders. However, I need to wait for my battery to charge up a little bit. It is pretty drained, so it's cranking really slow. And I don't want it to just run completely dry. So I'm going to give it a little bit of time to charge up. And then I'm going to do a compression test on these two cylinders. And since I don't have spark plugs, I'll just put the old ones back in. Um, it is really looking like I need to pull the heads off of this truck because... Those are not good numbers. And here's another thing I noticed. You see this EGR looking thing? I don't know if that's an EGR or just a vacuum thing, but uh, there's a hole there. So this needs to be replaced, whatever that is. Uh, that uh, It really does look like some kind of EGR system for this truck. So uh, that does need to be replaced. There is no way this truck will run right with a big hole. Well, as you can see here, today I have a much better setup. It's still a setup for disappointment and failure, but it is a setup. So I've got this table over here. I've got a whole bunch of vacuum lines, and today we're going to try to figure this out because I think the vacuum lines are playing a huge part into why this thing won't start. So I did recharge the battery, and I found what I think to be a better ground location. The truck does start a lot easier and the negative terminal doesn't get nearly as hot, but I'm still not sure if it needs to be here or if it needs to be here, or if it just, if I could just tie it to both here and here, I'm not exactly sure. And apparently the collective knowledge of the entire internet has no answers for me. Uh, there's conflicting answers as to if it should be on the block directly or if it should be close to the alternator on this bracket. So maybe the answer is actually both, but I can't find a bolt for this. I can find a bolt for that. So that's what we're going with for now. And I do believe that um, getting a strong enough crank that if it can catch and start, that this will at least run it for, you know, a few seconds that I need to start to feel good about this project. So let's start trying to figure out the vacuum. I'm probably actually just going to take it all out and start over because I have no idea who touched what and uh, if someone rerouted something over the years, etc, etc, etc. So I believe this to be the windshield wipers. And uh, yeah, this is this needs to be rewired. So I went ahead and unhooked that, set that aside, and I start digging in deeper to the wiring. And I found another wire that is also exposed thanks to the fire, and it is this guy right here. And you see, it is or was touching the ground strap. So that I believe is. Uh, remember that second time that I said, oh, I still smell burning? I believe that's what that was. I don't know what this wire is or what it does. And that's going to be really hard to, to uh, run a new one because of where it is. It's so tight back there. Uh, I do know that I have to pull the heads and the carburetor anyway. So that alone may... Uh, cast away any hope of being able to start this thing. I have to figure out what that wire does. Uh, I see it runs over here to this plug, but I don't know what this plug does. And it's pretty charred back here too, so a lot of this needs to get replaced. Uh, if I can find out what that does, maybe I can just disable it temporarily. I just clip this whole thing out because it is melted together and obviously I'm not going to be able to separate that and there was no point in separating it because it was burned on both sides so this side now let me orient this so this side here connected to this up here which goes into this main conduit here 
And then this on the other side of the harness splits off and goes in two different directions. So this one goes down behind the engine. That was the one that I said was going to be very, very hard to uh, reconcile. This one goes to this guy, which runs up to this thing here. And this makes a lap all the way back around to these vacuum lines. So I believe this is part of the emission system. So obviously I do need to resolve this if I ever intend to make this thing smog legal. So worst case scenario, when I replace this, I will get like a four pin connector and then just leave an open uh, port to plug in a uh, pin to connect to, I don't know, um, whatever. Um, I'm not sure what this is supposed to branch off of. Um, is it a branch off of the green side or the blue side? I don't know. It's, it's really hard to tell. I'm going to have to look up a wiring diagram. I hate diagrams. So I just made my first parts order for this thing. I was kind of lucky that this contraption existed on Rock Auto because I kind of ruined it. Uh, this is, I forget what it was called, but it bolts into the exhaust manifold and it's like a collector thing. All I have to do is remove the valve that's uh, on this side of the nut here. And I'll be able to put that on the new contraption when it arrives. This guy I had a little trouble finding. This is the decelerator valve. The idea is that when you lift off the throttle and the engine creates a sudden burst of vacuum, uh, this helps the motor uh, reduce uh, its revs in a controlled manner so that you have less backfiring. Um, you know, they say you don't need this, but Here's the thing, I live in California and we have very strict emission standards. Uh, this needs to exist in my truck because it came equipped with it from the factory. So if I were to remove it, I definitely would not document that on YouTube because I don't want to document crimes on YouTube. So I had a hard time finding this, but I am going to replace it with a generic decelerator valve. It's an AC Delco. Um, I'm pretty sure it does the job exactly the same. The only difference is it doesn't have this mounting bracket. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to mount the new thing when it arrives. But that is a problem for future me. I've also bought a new PCV just because the PCV that I have, I'm pretty sure is no good. And I broke it, of course. Um, the smog pump. This is the smog pump. Um, this is not, I thought this was air conditioning, but it is not. This truck does not come equipped with air conditioning. This is a smog pump and it makes, uh, some pretty horrible noises. So I probably have to replace that as well. And this is the pipe that goes to the smog pump that goes into this thing. It's like a control valve. And then we have an EGR, which is somewhere. I also ordered a new EGR. I believe this is the EGR, actually. Uh, I, I did buy a new EGR because I don't trust this one to have held up. It's registered in Oregon for a reason and not California. I have another melted part. This is the distributor delay valve. So uh, what happens is we've got this guy over here. This is the vacuum regulator, I suppose. Distributor vacuum regulator. It goes up into the delay valve, which uh, runs out to this here, uh, which is called, let me find it on the motor. It is called uh, the TVS thermal vacuum switch. So when uh, this helps the, uh, the truck when it's warming up, and it do, I believe it does not send vacuum when the uh, truck is when the engine is cold. So this will open up and then we get a vacuum advance. So then this runs to the distributor. The only problem is this is a little melty. So I have to find a new one of these. Uh, this over here also had some melt on it, but it was only on the tip and I could feel that the uh, vacuum 
port was still open. So I was able to slip a slightly larger hose on and uh, still use that. But I have to find a, a distributor delay valve and that might be a little tough for this truck. Um, I'm gonna try to find, if I can find a generic, I'm willing to give that a shot. Uh, just like I did with the uh, D-cell valve, I'm gonna try and see if I can find, at the very least, a generic and then swap that in and see what happens. Um, this was a lot of work. I gotta say, I, I got rid of a lot of stuff. Uh, I've got this thing that was literally just um, an adapter. And then I had another uh, really large adapter that went on here. And um, you know, that's down here on the ground. And I removed this one because it was really, really cracked. You could see just how rotted it was. So this just wasn't worth using. And it really, at the end of the day, made the vacuum system, I'm sure, pretty useless. So now I have all new vacuum lines on the truck. And once I can replace these couple of parts, I should have a much better time starting and running this truck, even though I've got one completely dead cylinder. Uh, the goal here is to be able to move this truck into my garage under its own power so that I can uh, pull the heads and do head gaskets in the garage because I just don't want to do that work out here. So we're going to check back in in a couple of days uh, and see if that all works and starts up. I'm also, in the meantime, going to start working on the wiring uh, for this thing. So I still don't know exactly what this does, but I did determine it comes off of this switch here. So this is Transseal Cond Conv Vac Switch. So it's some kind of vacuum switch. I believe it has something to do with the transmission, which tracks because of that wire that runs down behind the engine. It, it I assume, goes into the transmission. So I have to research what this is supposed to do, and uh, then I will start creating a new harness for that thing. I don't know if it's essential to run this thing from here to there. If it's not, then I'm just going to ignore it. But uh, if it turns out it is very important, then I will go ahead and hook that up. So it's going to be a few days while we wait for parts to arrive for the engine. Let's do some work on the interior, and we're going to start by cleaning it. Uh, it is pretty dirty in here, so we're going to use only the highest quality professional automotive detailing equipment here. After stage one of our cleaning process and you can see we still have a lot of work to do behind the seat front of the seat there's actually a lot of wet dirt that stuck to the floor there so I need to wait for that to dry and then probably hit it with a leaf blower again uh, or I might be able to vacuum it out at that point but uh, that's pretty bad uh, over here it did clean up a little bit better on the passenger side so the dashboard and the seat, and I think most of the cab here, I think is gonna be ready for stage two of our cleaning process. And so let's go take a look at our top shelf cleaning chemicals. Only the best for my trucks. Ah.
Don't forget to shake. All right, stage two complete. Well, almost. Obviously, I still have a lot of work to do on the floor of the driver's side, but that's because I'm still waiting for all that to dry. You can see it's starting to dry, but I need it to be just bone dry so that I can vacuum it or leaf blow it or whatever I feel like doing at the time. And the buckets, um, yeah, thankfully this, this uh, cleaning agent that I used is biodegradable, so I could just dump it on the ground. I'm probably gonna wipe down this uh, door sill a little bit more, and then I'll dump that. After I do that, I'm going to bring out the actual cleaning chemicals and see what I can do with this dash just in a quick pass. Uh, I'm not going to go into it with a toothbrush and Q-tips. You know, my name's not Tyson Hughey after all. Um, if you really want to do that, if your car is, it really is too clean, come on over and uh, help me clean up this truck because I pretty much will never use a toothbrush and q-tips to clean this thing I, I can guarantee it so if that's your jam come on over i got plenty of work for you to do all right well this is much much better but you can tell this is still no restoration project unfortunately i tried two different chemicals for cleaning and restoring this dash and it just went right back to having all of this fade so uh Unfortunately, I think parts or all of this is going to need to be painted. Uh, the door panels definitely are going to need paint because the, I mean, it's just all scuffed up and roughed. Uh, same with the A pillars. The uh, roof liner, obviously there is no roof liner, so I am not touching that because I do not want it to rain down asbestos on my face. And the steering wheel, I need to scrub it and I don't feel like scrubbing it right now. I just really wanted to not have a big cloud of dust every time I sit down. So once this floor dries out, we're gonna clean that and we'll, we'll wipe down the rest of the floor while we're in here, but we're gonna call this done for now. If you know of a product that will bring this back to life, or even better, if you make a product that you would like me to demo on this truck, let me know because I am open to suggestion here. I will try anything. This truck is an experiment. It was free, so I have nothing to lose. All things considered, this is a free truck and it looks great for a free truck. You know, from this angle, the Studebaker looks enormous compared to the S10, but it's all mostly empty space. You see here, we've got the Canopy of Crisis, the Tent of Torment over the S10. And we're going to do some more work. And, and thankfully, we've got our new workbench. So what are we waiting on? We're still waiting on our little tree of EGR that comes out of the header. Uh, we're still waiting on the PCV. Uh, and some other uh, little things here and there. But we did get the new smog pump and we got the new vacuum connection, which goes, which is supposed to go uh, into the distributor uh, with this little um, um, switch to uh, activate the vacuum line. So hopefully I can get that all connected correctly. Now here's the new smog pump and here's the old smog pump. The old smog pump is really hard to turn. So I can't turn it at all, really hardly with one finger. And it's pretty noisy. The new one still makes a little bit of noise, but it is a whole lot easier to turn. It still gives a little resistance as it, you know, pumps the air, but it's a whole lot easier so this was still a good idea. Did I need it? I don't know, maybe not, but let's put it in anyway. Not gonna lie, that was not as pleasant as I thought it was gonna be. The new smog pump was a very, very tight fit in the bracket. I actually had to take a grinder to the upper mount of the new smog pump so that it would fit in the bracket. But it's all on now, as we can see here. I got the pulley on. I didn't 
clean it up very much. All I did was spray it down with carb cleaner. I think it'll be fine. Uh, I do need to put the power steering pump on before I can start replacing the belts. Uh, I also got a new EGR valve. You can see it back here. I need to get a new length of hose because the old EGR was had had its outlet on the other side, so it was a really short run to uh, this connection down here. But the new one, as you can see, is pointed backwards, so I need longer length of line. I also got this thing replaced. I'm not exactly sure if I have it connected correctly. It's going to be a little trial and error because this valve is a different orientation than the old one. See if I can find the old one and I will show you. Can I find it? Oh. So here's the old one. You can see that it has two ports going one direction. And then it has this guy, you know, uh, like that. And this, uh, well, it is not that. So I'm just kind of taking my best guess. And I am quite likely to be wrong. But I'll cross that bridge when we get there. I just want to get all of the parts in and on the truck. And then I could try to figure it out from there. Before I throw this part out, let's go take a look at the old EGR. As you can see, let's get it out in the light so you can really see it. This is, this is completely packed. So there was no way that this was going to be functioning correctly. Uh, the diaphragm is completely stuck too. So there is, I mean, I'm really glad I replaced this. There was no chance of this truck ever passing smog with an EGR this bad. So next I want to take on uh, this vacuum issue, try to figure out, try to see if I can get it running a little more smoothly. And then next I need to put a used tire on the back so that I can move it. That's gonna be really exciting. So I have that shredded tire there. I'm gonna have a used tire put on that rim. That way this is the spare. And that way uh, if I do get it running anytime soon, it's not really a waste because that'll still be a spare. You know, changing a tire is generally considered to be one of the easiest things that you could do on a motor vehicle. However, for me, it, that still isn't even easy. You see, yesterday, I was gonna do this off camera just because it's such a simple, stupid little thing. And it all happened so fast that I wasn't gonna run and grab the camera, but uh, I put the jack underneath the truck and I started to lift the truck. And as the wheel came off the ground, there was a massive pile of earwigs. There had to have been 500 earwigs underneath that wheel that just started scurrying away. The ground came alive and it was so disgusting that I just said, you know what? That's it. I'm calling it a day. So now that they've had a chance to go underground and find a new place to live, let's try to change this. And I am now wearing boots, pants, and I may bring out a flamethrower because that was, that was really disgusting. You know, I think I've finally discovered the real reason why this truck wasn't running. You see, this truck requires gasoline to run. Instead, it was full of nightmare fuel. So I'm told that the radiator leaks. So I want to confirm that with my uh, radiator test gauge. So I'm going to pressurize it and hopefully the bugs won't eat me alive while I do this. Oh yeah, it's definitely leaking. In fact, I think I can hear it. Yeah, you see it, all the pumping I've done and it just keeps going back down. So there is a leak in the system somewhere. So before I go spending money on this thing, getting a new radiator, which I still wanna do, uh, I do want to take off the fan shroud, take off the fan, try to pressurize the system and find the exact source of the leak because 
it may not be the radiator. Um, it, it probably is, but it, it it's impossible to tell here. E even looking on, on the ground, uh, because we're in the dirt, the water just goes right into the dirt. So I can't even see where it might be leaking from. So I really want to get a better vantage point on this. Uh, this is something that I'll revisit when I get this truck into the garage. So now we've got the back tire on. We've got the radiator filled with distilled water. We do know it leaks, but again, that's why I filled it with distilled water and not coolant. I don't want to put anything expensive in here. I know it's going to leak, but I just needed to get it from one spot to another spot. And um, distilled water is going to get us there. Probably don't even need to do anything. It's not going to run that long anyway, but it always helps to be sure. So we're going to try to move this thing. And first we're going to move it just kind of straight back because I want to try to get this trailer out of the way. Get this door card out of the way. All right, let's see if we start. That was underwhelming. I'm going to give it a second to All right, let's try to move it. It's also give us an indication of brake pressure. Okay, yeah, that still feels, sounds pretty lumpy. We could still have a dead cylinder. Okay, this is cool though. So now that these things run, I really want to get the Studebaker over there on the left. I want to get the truck to the right of the Studebaker and I want to have the trailer kind of out here-ish so that I can hook up my Jeep to it whenever I need to. Also, that gives me an opportunity to fix up the trailer and hopefully sell it pretty soon.
Well, there you have it. Both of my trucks run not very well, but they both run and they stop. We're off to a really good start with both of these trucks. Obviously we have a long, long journey ahead of us and I really have to decide now which one am I gonna put my time and attention and money into first. Do I fix this up, potentially do a head gasket or do I do a rear end on this? Uh, and they both, by the way, have some title issues. This one is registered in Oregon. It's registered to both of my uncles, so that's not a problem. This one also has a bit of a title issue. It is in the name of a business that was owned by my grandfather who passed away about 15 years ago. So that means with the Studebaker, I'll probably have to lean sail. And with the S10, I will definitely have some fun getting through smog inspection. Yeah, I'm not sure which one I'm going to go with either. So thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see, like, share, subscribe, and comment. If you don't like what you see, leave a comment anyway. I would love to hear from you and talk about it. I can't think of anything funny to say, so we'll just call it there. See you in the next video.